Hello there, welcome to Brian Lomax Movie Talk. My ranking of all of Christopher Nolan's feature films, uh, his theatrically released stuff. Yes, uh, goes without saying, Nolan is my favourite director. Uh, five of his movies sat in my top 20 movies of all time. Uh, I kind of have to say now that it has moved up to six movies that sit in my 20 movies of all time so yeah it goes without saying love this guy love his films um if you look at this ranking here there's really no point getting bent out of shape by the positions in which i put them because like i say six of these movies are in my top 20 of all time uh there's only two movies on this list now three sorry there's only three movies on this list that i wouldn't give a five out of five i went to see tenet recently i've reviewed that film if you want to know my in-depth thoughts on that please do check out my review uh, but i did say in that review that i didn't want to do this ranking until i'd seen the film again I will say I have been to see it again since, so I'm now a little bit more kind of, yeah, certain about where I'm going to put it. So yes, as usual with a ranking video, I'm going to start with my least favourite, but when dealing with Nolan, that's not really a criticism because like, like I say, I like every film on this list, uh, but we're going to start with my least favourite and work my way to my favourite. Uh, people who are, you know, not new to my channel, who know me, who've seen many of my videos i'm pretty certain you will know what my top few are going to be anyway at this point but e either way let's let's just get into it so 11 films let's start with number 11. Uh, at number 11 i'm going to put following this is nolan's feature debut uh yes he made this on weekends over the course of a year, basically getting together with friends, uh, shooting in locations that they knew, that they had, that they you know that they lived around, um, and it's it's really the the shining light of this film is the script, is the concept, is already Nolan playing with time, playing with non-linear editing you know like jumping backwards and forwards so that it kind of messes with your mind so you're not quite sure where you are it disorientates you a bit um i think the thing that really lets the film down in comparison to say like well any other nolan film is the budget it is the budgetary constraints you know the, the actors in this are amateur i would say i mean they are professional actors i believe you know they've, they've gone on to do stuff but Clearly, this was a bunch of students kind of getting together on weekends. They weren't quite at the professional status yet, and that shows. It really shows. Um, I think if you took this script now and, yeah, it gave it Nolan again to kind of to do with big actors and, and a proper budget and stuff, then it, it would be absolutely brilliant. Um, as it stands, it's just a very interesting, very complex brilliant debut you know i'd still only give it a three and a half out of five but it, it's just for what he achieves with very little resources it, it, it's very promising at number 10 is insomnia this is a remake a very good remake it must be said now i've not seen the original uh, so i can't tell you if this is one of the best remakes ever made or anything but it is a nolan film and he he again he you know he he does play with time a little bit uh he kind of does that whole thing with the editing we do see flashbacks and whatnot but as far as nolan goes this is probably his most straight laced film well, you know probably about it it is his most straight laced film it's the one that kind of feels in nolan terms generic but by anybody else's standards this is a top rate thriller uh it's it's yeah you know if, if, if you like those kind of movies detective thrillers in which you've got a, a detective going on the hunt for a serial killer uh, then uh, this is up there. This is a really good one. I think it's got two great performances by Al Pacino and uh, Robin Williams, rest in peace. Um, and I just like the way it's shot. Uh, so Wally Pfister, who has collaborated with Nolan on, on many of his films uh, as DP, uh, he, he was here on this. And yeah, it, it's got that flavour of Nolan that has now become like a signature hallmark. Uh, something that I don't think feel, feel like was there, say, in um, following or even Memento from a visual standpoint. Certainly storytelling-wise it was, 
but uh, here in Insomnia, I think uh, Nolan's really getting to grips now with, with the camera, what he can do with it, how to visualize scenes, uh, and he's starting to get like a signature look, you know, where, where you look at the visuals on screen and there's just something about it that tells you you're in a Nolan film. Uh, so yeah, like I say, as far as Nolan goes, it's, it's quite a generic film, uh, but by anybody else's standards, cracking stuff. At number nine is Memento. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of people who will hate the fact that I've put this so far down on the list. Please bear in mind, once again, I love all these movies. Memento, I'd give a four and a half out of five. Um, I, I do think it's incredibly well written and orchestrated. Uh, I just find, for me, that it doesn't quite have the rewatch value of some of his other work. Now, I have rewatched it several times, uh, and I will rewatch it again. It is a film I love and appreciate a great deal. Um, I, I just, yeah, like I say, it's, 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 it's like you're taking a load of what, to me, are a bunch of genius films, and you're trying to argue which is the least genius. Um, from a writing standpoint, I get why anyone would, would put this up there. It is, it is absolutely great, and because Nolan was coming out of the gate, uh, you know, this was his proper kind of film, really. I know Following was his first feature, but it was, yeah, it didn't really have any studio backing or anything like that. It was just something he made with his friends. This was the first kind of proper movie, I guess. I, that sounds a bit disparaging to Following when I say that, but you know what I mean when I say that, I hope. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it, it's it's one of those films where this is a guy who's like, You've never heard of him. He comes out the gate swinging with this film. It's just absolutely blinding, really clever, and instantly puts him on the map. But I, I do find that I, I tend to revisit most of his other work before going back to Memento. Uh, so it's, yeah, that rewatch factor is quite an important thing for me. And number eight is Dunkirk. I know a lot of people are quite down on this film. They feel like there's not enough character development in it. Uh, it didn't bother me because for me, it was more about the experience of war. It was about dropping you into that situation and making you feel what all these men on the front line are feeling. And, and, and it get. It puts you in the position of, like any soldier, not knowing who the guy next to you is, not knowing who the, that troop of men there are, but because you're in this situation together that is life and death, you will put your life on the line for them. They will put their life on the line for you. You know you're on the same team. And I just, I like that visceral kind of energy that the film has from start to finish, like literally from the opening shot when, we're with this with this troop of men, and, and then they start taking fire, uh, and then they go on the run, and it leads us onto the beaches of Dunkirk. And from that moment on, you know, you're in the thick of it, and you're probably not getting out until the very end of the film. So it's like, yeah, I just think as a visceral experience, it is absolutely incredible, and one of my favourite war films. At number seven for me is The Prestige. Another again, every film from here on out, well, since Dunkirk. Is, is basically a five star movie for me. So uh, just, just bear that in mind when you, you know, when you think that I've put something too low or whatever. Uh, yeah, prestige, five star film. It's it's amazing. Uh, I I just for, it's, it it's one of those films where the first time I watched it, I I wasn't sure if I liked it. Uh, mostly because of the ending. Uh, it just it just kind of sucker punched me. It wasn't what I was expecting at all. And then when, as I thought about it and then revisited it, I realized that's exactly what the film is kind of all about. It's, you know, it uses the setup of a magic trick uh, to kind of analyze the way we tell stories, the way that narrative cinema is driven. You know, it's, all, it's almost very similar to the way that a magic trick is set up. Um, and so all the way through the film, Nolan is telling you really what the ending is. But because you don't want to believe that, because you, you, you're you expecting something grander, something uh, you know, genuinely like a magic trick, um, not science fiction, which it goes into, then, then you feel like you've had the rug pulled from under you, but you only kind of have yourself to blame. Uh, well, you know, like I say, once you go back and you revisit the film, you realise what it's doing. I just, I just think it's ingenious. And more than that, it kind of transcends that, um, as I believe that a lot of Nolan's work does, it transcends that kind of intellectual kind of gymnastics 
by having some heart in it, by having characters that you can relate to and feel for and despise in some ways. So you've got these two characters played by Christian Bale and Hugh Jackman, these two magicians, and it's this constant game of one-upmanship. And the film is really about obsession and how obsession takes over someone's life and kind of destroys you from within. When, it be when, when, when something becomes your focus above all other things, um, then yeah, it can be a very destructive force of nature. Uh, so I, I think it's a brilliant film. Again, a lot to say, great characters. I love the performances by the two main stars um, and just th that ending, again, uh, it just makes much more sense on repeat viewings. Number six for me is Inception. Uh, yeah, just again, brilliantly conceived. It's one of those films where when you first watch it, you're kind of just like, how? How does somebody come up with this? How does somebody sit down, have the, these ideas, not only have these ideas, but implement them on screen to this degree where it, it's just so expertly done. So yeah. It's, it's brilliantly crafted. Um, now, the only thing for me, and, and it's, it's kind of what puts the next film slightly above it, like the, the Inception and my next choice, I just, I like that. Depending on what day it is, I, I could flip them around. And I suppose that could be said for, for most of the films on this list, to be honest. But um, I, one of the problems for the film for me is and again is a minute problem i, I just I, I'm, I'm calling it a problem because it's it's just it's so it's just a way of justifying why this is a bit lower down than some of the others and it's the character played by marion cotillard Mal, uh, Mal. so um obviously if you've seen the film you know what i'm talking about it's 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 uh cobb's wife but we we never really get to see cobb's wife when she is normal when she is not affected by mental disorder and disorientation uh, due to having been in the dream world for so long. So we only kind of get to see her when she's either a broken woman who's about to kill herself or when she's just a crazy kind of representation of this woman from Cobb's mind, from Cobb's subconscious. And as a result, as a result of that, I find her character to be quite cold, despite the, despite the fact that Marion Cotillard does give a really good performance. For, for, for what, her, what is needed of her character, you know, there are times where she's actually quite scary uh, because she is a very unpredictable kind of projection of Cobb's subconscious. She can do anything. She might, yeah, really scupper things and whatnot. And there are moments there where it, it's, it's almost like something out of a out of a horror film, like The Shining or something like that. There's moments where, like when um, Ariadne goes down in the lift of Cobb's subconscious and, and finds him talking to Maul, and then Maul quickly looks at her, like, boom, no, realises she's there and looks at her. And that ho the way that's all set up, the way it's shot, the uh, the music cue in it and stuff, it's, it's very much something out of a horror film. It does kind of, it, it, there's something off about it. It, makes, it creeps me out a bit. Um, so... You know, so what's asked of her by Nolan and by the script, she does really well with, you know, and, and, and scenes towards the end where, where, where Cobb's having to let go of that subconscious projection of her, uh, his memories of her, um, her performance in that moment is really great. But again, as I say, because we've only ever experienced Maul through this twisted, distorted view of her, twisted, distorted memories of her, I'm, I feel I'm not as warm to her as as well i'll get into the, the next film now which is number five and that is of course tenet uh so yeah very <laughs> dense 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 film uh you know if you thought inception was hard to wrap your brain around then yeah wait till you experience tenet it must be said it's a very dense film uh thankfully when i went to see it the first time around i was in a very switched on mood um you know and and i i managed to keep up and i i took something away from it i felt like i understood it and then i went back a second time watched it again a bit more relaxed now you know knowing where it was going and i picked up on certain things that i didn't get before which only enriched the film for me and and made it even better on a second watch um and, and one of the things as i as i've said as a, the thing that pushes it above inception for me because i think they're both brilliantly written 
both brilliantly conceived, both have amazing action set pieces in it. But for me, I feel a bit more connected to the characters. Uh, and I know a lot of people who've seen this film, I've seen a lot of reviews now that are saying that there's, there's no emotional kind of core in this film. It's all ideas and it's just uh, like no one's dropped the ball because there's no one you identify with, there's no character development. I just don't think that's true at all. Um, so Elizabeth Debicki's character in it, I, I, she to me is the heart of the film and I, like the journey she goes on and her performance, uh, Debicki's performance in that really sucks me in and I feel so much more towards her than I do towards Moll in Inception and I think because we're getting a real person there, a real rounded person uh, rather than this this weird kind of distorted memory of a person uh, that can be quite scary at times. Uh, I, I just, I feel more connected as a result. So yeah, so I don't really buy those arguments that I'm hearing from people. Um, again, it's subjective, you know, film is subjective. There's no right or wrong, you know, like, I'm not gonna tell someone they're wrong because they put Inception above Tenet. If that's the subjective experience you had, if you felt more when watching Inception than you did with Tenet, then that's your subjective experience. You can't change that. It, you feel what you feel. Um, so you're not wrong. It's just, I, 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 when it came to these two films, Tenet kind of won out for me. I, I, I was on the edge of my seat a lot more, I feel. I, th I feel like uh, Nolan's gone even bigger with some of the action set pieces that are just so entertaining. And from start to finish, I was just sucked into this world. Um, and you know, people are talking so fast and giving it, a lot of people say ex it's all exposition, 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 but all that exposition takes place within action, you know, within movement, with it. Things are happening all the time as this exposition is, is happening. So Again, I, I said this in my review, it's it's not a case of telling and not showing, it's it's telling through the art of showing. It's just, yeah, it's brilliantly done. Uh, and I found myself on the edge of my seat the whole time listening to every word, you know? Because like the, 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 you're 10, 15 minutes into this film and it's one of them films where you realize, right, I'm gonna have to keep up here. I've got to up my game mentally and I've got to keep up. And from that point on, I'm on the edge of my seat and I'm listening to every word. I'm considering every every sentence that is said. And, and that's what I was like from my first viewing. And, and I love that. I love that Nolan can do that, that he, he stops you from being a passive viewer. He forces you to be an active viewer. You know, if you're sat there and you're just munching popcorn, checking your phone now and again, you're going to be lost. This ain't the film for you. Um, but... Yeah, if you're willing to go for that ride and pay attention, I just think it's a, a very rewarding film. And it's a film about faith. Uh, I, I, I may be doing a video on this over on my other channel, The Movie Evangelist, at some point, so I don't want to go any further into it. But I, I do think it, it, it deals heavily with themes of faith, uh, fate, destiny, uh, the will of, uh, of a higher power, a grand design, whatever you want to call it. Uh, yeah, it's a great film. I loved it. It was even more rewarding on second watch, and it is my number five. And number four is Interstellar. This is the film of Christopher Nolan's that I think probably makes me feel the most. This is the one that certainly gets up there because of the way it makes me feel. I think there was, I've seen this film three times now, and th there's a couple of scenes that, that bring me to tears each time I've watched it. So it, it definitely has heart. I know, I think I think that's one of the things people criticise about it. Nolan can't kind of win, really. People people say he either has not enough heart or he goes too sentimental, which I just don't understand. But uh, yeah, the, so the ending is often criticised for, for going down the route of sentimentality. It didn't bother me because it's a film about, about love, about heart, about, you know, the, the, the experience of life. Uh, having no value if it's only about the intellectual and not about the soul, not about the heart, not about love. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's that love that kind of gives meaning and purpose to life. So I think it's a great film. It plucks my heartstrings. It's on a technical level, 
it's absolutely expertly crafted uh, and I, yeah I, you know, I've rewatched it several times it's probably not the one I'm going to go to most just because of the sheer length I think it is Nolan's longest film so it's, it's not just one you can bang on and go yeah I'll just watch this for a bit you need a good three hour block so for that reason it's kind of hard to, to go and re-watch it every so often. But uh, yeah, it is one that I do want to watch again and again. So we're in my top three, and I'm sure this comes as no surprise, as I say, to anyone who knows me. It's the Dark Knight trilogy. I'm not going to go through them separately. It, like I say, if you know strangers to my channel, you know these are my favourite movies of all time. Uh, if you want an order, then three is Dark Knight Rises, two is Batman Begins, and number one is The Dark Knight. Uh, Dark Knight is my favourite movie of all time. Is it a perfect movie? No. Uh, you know, it's, I, I don't think any movie is perfect. I think if you look hard enough, you can find imperfections. Uh, but for me, what, what makes The Dark Knight my favourite movie of all time is... One, I, I'm just a Batman fan. You know, I've been a Batman fan since 1991, uh, Christmas of 91, uh, when Tim Burton's first Batman film was first aired on... on uh, television over Christmas I, I be instantly became a fan um, uh, yeah I, I've just I've loved the character every, ever since and this this was the film that as a Batman fan I felt like I'd been waiting for you know uh, as much as I, I loved Burton's Batman and, and the animated series and all that I just f for live action I watched this and it was just the best cinema experience I'd ever had in my life and I went to see it eight times at the cinema um, so yeah I love it. I love the other two as well. Uh, it's very hard to kind of place them. Uh, they All three films have a different vibe about them. Uh, I love the thematic exploration that Christopher Nolan goes on with these three films of fear, chaos and pain throughout the trilogy. Uh, I just think, yeah, it's, it's again, it's, it's hard to put them in order, but if, if, if I had to, that'd be the order I'd put them in. Um, and could change on any given day i guess I, I just there you go that's my top three uh dark knight rises are number three i i love bane i think he's one of the best cinematic villains ever uh i don't really get a lot of the criticisms for the film with regards to the ending and and, and whatnot it's, it's 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 up there with me with the other two films i i, I just yeah Again, as a Batman fan, uh, particularly as a Bane fan, Bane being like one of my favourite comic book vil uh, villains of all time, when he's done right, which is usually when Chuck Dixon is writing him and Graham Nolan is drawing him, uh, he, he's been, I think Bane has been got wrong more times than he's been got right. But when, he, when, it, when he's got right, he's, yeah, he's an unbeatable adversary. Uh, he's both intellectually and physically challenging for Batman. So, uh, yeah, I love that Nolan got him right. Uh, changed him quite a bit from the comic books, but still in a way that was completely recognisable, in a way that was completely Bane, in the same way that he did with the Joker. You know, there was no falling in the acid for Joker in The Dark Knight. It's a complete revamp of the character in many ways. And yet, the essence of the character is all there. Um, so, yeah brilliant trilogy my favorite trilogy of all time my favorite movies of all time from my favorite director of all time i love all these movies as i say my least favorite following still gets a three and a half out of five uh, and there are eight movies on this list that get a five six of which are in my top 20 movies of all time so call me an Olin fanboy i'm sure it's yeah sure it's deserved i admit it i'm an Olin fanboy uh, there's no no escaping that fact when I've got six of his movies in my top 20. So, I want to know what your ranking is. Uh, you've heard mine. Let me hear yours. Put your ranking in the uh, in the comments down below. Uh, all 11 films, how would you rank them? If you've not seen all 11, just tell me the ones you have seen. What is your favourite? Why is it your favourite? And which films do you disagree with on my list? I'm sure you will tell me. Uh, but yeah, I want to hear your thoughts. Comment below, let me know. And until next time... Cracking.